I fired on seven machines on the aerodrome. One of them took off and I fired 15 rounds at him from close range, 60 feet up, and he crashed. A second one taking off, I opened fire and fired 30 rounds at 150 yards. He crashed into a tree. Two more were taking off together. I climbed and engaged one, finishing my drum, and he crashed 300 yards from the aerodrome. I changed drums and climbed. A fourth came after me and I fired one whole drum into him. Combat report, William Bishop, Royal Flying Corps. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War bio special of who did what in World War I. Today, Canada's greatest flying ace, Billy Bishop. William Avery Bishop was born February 8, 1894 to William and Margaret Bishop of Owen Sound, Ontario. His father was the county registrar. Young Billy excelled in sports and was the class clown, but did poorly academically. In 1911, at age 17, his parents sent him to the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. He failed his first year and after making it up, did well his second year. In his third year, he was caught cheating on his final. He had turned in his crib notes with his paper. A final decision on his expulsion was delayed until the end of summer, but this being the summer of 1914, the war intervened. Bishop was quickly commissioned into a cavalry detachment, but he contracted pneumonia and was hospitalized when his unit left for Europe. He was then assigned to the 14th Battalion Canadian Mounted Rifles. Just before he headed to war, he proposed to Margaret Burden and she accepted. His unit was sent to the Kentish coast and the rain, mud and endless horse manure, he was in the cavalry, made life miserable and Bishop wanted to fly, eventually fixing a transfer to the Royal Flying Corps, but as an observer. The first aircraft Billy Bishop flew in was the Farman Series 11 Shorthorn, described by Billy like this. I don't think she made more than 50 miles per hour and as for climbing, she struggled and shook and gasped like a freight train going up a mountainside, but it was thrilling enough for me in those days. The squadron soon received its first modern aircraft, the RE-7 Reconnaissance Experimental, loaded with the pilot, an observer, a machine gun, and a camera. It could barely maintain 70 miles per hour as a top speed and could only reach an altitude of 5,000 feet after 30 minutes of flying. And it was a sitting duck for the Fokker E3 monoplanes with their forward firing synchronized machine guns. In fact, the fear of the enemy was so great that sorties would often have 12 airplanes to escort one reconnaissance plane. Bishop served four months as a frontline observer. The spring of 1916 was rough for Bishop, to say the least. He was in a truck accident, knocked unconscious for two days while working on his plane, had an infected tooth, and then suffered a knee injury. He also was found to have a heart murmur. But by November, he was in pilot training on Salisbury Plain, flying a short horn. Flight instruction consisted of getting into a short horn with dual controls and copying what the pilot did. The machine was too noisy for communication. The instructors were either recuperating from frontline action or were new to flying themselves, so they had no real idea of how to fly an aircraft in anything other than ordinary conditions, and they did not teach aerial combat maneuvers. After completing his training, Bishop was posted to home defense and flew night patrols across southern England looking for Zeppelin raids. In two months, Bishop did not see a single one. In February 1917, he was posted to Arras, where across the trenches was the famed Flying Circus of Baron Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. The Canadian rookie would face the best flyers in Germany, the deadliest aces in the world. The average lifespan for rookie pilots was 11 days. Billy Bishop's first dogfight came on March 25, 1917. He was flying Tail End Charlie, the last aircraft of a flight of four and the most dangerous position, which is perhaps another reason for the short lifespan of a rookie. Three Albatross D3s dove in on them, one chasing the squadron commander. Bishop followed it and raked its fuselage and it dove to earth. Near the ground, a German pilot pulled out of his faked death dive only to find Bishop still on his tail. Bishop fired from point blank range and the Albatross thundered into the ground. His first flight, his first kill. He soon adopted tactics similar to English ace Albert Ball. Gain the upper hand through surprise and altitude, fight with the sun to your back, and don't give the Hun an even chance. Billy Bishop also had 
what every ace has, an excellent sense of situational awareness, knowing where you are in relation to the enemy, the ground, and your allies in three dimensions. He won the Military Cross on April 7, 1917. He had pursued an observation balloon to the ground and set it on fire. An albatross tried to interfere and he shot it down too. Balloons were tough targets, being well defended by anti-aircraft guns, machine guns, and fighters. The next day, Bishop single-handedly attacked a flight of six albatrosses, shooting down three, and by the time April was over, five weeks after he had arrived at the front, Bishop had defeated 17 aircraft and was the squadron's leading ace. Only the Red Baron bettered his score, downing 21 British aircraft that month. This was bloody April, and Bishop's squadron had a loss rate of 105% for the month. 13 of the original 18 pilots were shot down, along with seven of their replacements. On June 2, 1917, Bishop flew his most famous mission, the raid on Estormel Aerodrome. Bishop flew the raid alone. When he reached the aerodrome, seven aircraft were lined up, motors running, awaiting pilots and observers. Bishop banked and dived, coming in perpendicular to the flight line and fired a 97-round drum of .303 bullets into the aircraft, killing a mechanic. A pilot took off, but his engine wasn't fully warmed up and he couldn't get enough power to take off easily. Bishop swooped around onto his tail and fired, sending him down. Another took off and Bishop circled around to six o'clock and fired, but missed. The German swerved, hit a tree and crashed. Neither enemy pilot was injured. Now Bishop's real troubles began. Two albatrosses took off together. Bishop eventually got in a clear shot, dropping one onto the field. He swung head-on towards the fourth German and fired the entire drum of 303 ammunition at him, missing completely. But this unnerved the German pilot who swung away and landed. Bishop made his way back to base unharmed. He was awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions, but he earned the distrust of some of his comrades who believed he had become too ambitious and may even have made up the attack. The closest Bishop came to death was on one routine patrol, flying close to the ground when he was hit in a fuel tank by a German ground fire. With his plane on fire, he just made it into Allied territory where he crashed into a tree and became stuck as his plane caught fire. A brief storm put out the fire before he was injured. By June 1918, Bishop had shot down 70 planes, one of them the great German ace Paul Billick with 31 victories of his own. But the Canadian government was worried that their great national hero would die in action and ordered Bishop home. His last day on the front was one of his greatest, shooting down three planes and causing two more to crash into each other. Following the war, his life became directionless. He traveled, he gave lectures, he started an airline with another Canadian ace, Billy Barker, but it failed. Eventually, he became sales director at Frontenac Oil. He did well in the oil business. During World War II, he was recruiting Marshall and he used his fame to draw recruits into the Air Force. He sold war bonds and he did inspection tours. Following that war, he went into semi-retirement and he and Margaret had a very active social life in Montreal. Billy Bishop died quietly in his sleep in 1956 while wintering in Florida. Billy Bishop survived the bloody April on the Western Front. Now that alone is testament to his skills as a pilot, as an ace, because flying on the other side, of course, was the Red Baron. And if you'd like to learn more about him, you can click here for our bio about him. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.